So good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Here with us, uh, dear Andrew L. Rod and Atsmonia Niv. How are you doing, guys? Uh, excellent, since we could see you. Oh. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, I'm still exploring, but uh, <laughs> I hope to find something. What you explored this, recently? This evening, yes. Now, I'm generally speaking, we're exploring all our lives. And, and then we find out that uh, somebody else has been exploring faster and better. <laughs> it's quite uh, frustrating, and that's what we got to talk about. This especially, especially when you're doing PhD research, it gets yeah. very frustrating to find that somebody got there two days before you or two weeks before you. Well, it happens, but I was talking about uh, somebody else we are going to talk about this evening. Ah, okay. So, so yes. what? Who, who are we talking about? about this evening, Axman. Who are we talking about? Yeah. We are talking about a phenomena. Mm -hmm. A phenomena which is uh, overcasting our lives and maybe influence the lives of uh, all human beings on this universe. It's called My Friend AI. Have you heard about it? I um, heard a bit about it. Rings a bell, yeah. <laughs> Rings a bell. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, go ahead. All right, well, um, it's actually a topic that I've been dealing with quite a bit lately because it is um, related to my PhD research. And uh, I've been reading about artificial superintelligence and artificial general intelligence lately. Basically, once it can do everything a human can do, what does that mean for us? What will happen? And there's all kinds of fantastic theories and terrifying ideas, but we really don't know for the most part. Something, though, that I read this morning, which is about what is actually happening now, was in a way a little bit more frightening for me. Uh, this author, and he's echoing something that I had written back in September, he said that there is an explosion of content that is AI generated that has no concern for quality, for story, for any of the standard little nuances that we have in literature or storytelling. He called it the enchidification of the internet. And what he's seeing, and what I'm seeing too, is that the internet is being polluted like a river would be polluted with content that really doesn't have any meaning or any significant human connection. Uh, the biggest offender to him was uh, toddlers' channels and children's channels on YouTube with completely AI generated videos that parents will just, it says it's educational, they'll put their children in front of it and leave them there for 30 minutes. When you actually watch those videos and I went through and did, um, it's, uh, it's almost like it was made by an alien who thinks they know what humans are like. It's uh, it just, it didn't make sense. It didn't have the proper story to it. Um, you could tell it was randomly generated so yeah when we talk about ai these days i'm optimistic about a lot of things but this enchidification concept is really something that strikes me today uh, the question is whether all these materials that you're talking about that have, have no connection with the uh, reality or with the facts or with the things that uh, children should listen to because they're very absurd. Are they being monitored before they come on the air uh, by humans? Uh, and, and this is the thing that, uh, <laughs> that uh, uh, as, as we talked uh, previously, um, 
I always check what the outcomes of, of the AI because I don't trust it or I don't fully trust it. And I think that if we leave things uh, totally to uh, AI and not control it and auditor it and do what is necessary to find out whether it uh, aligns with with uh, reality or with uh, with with the real stuff, the real material, then uh, it is a danger. One of yeah. the dangers of AI, and there yeah. are many dangers. Yeah, and and for me, you're you're hitting on something that is really a part of the problem. That the AI isn't the problem. The problem is quality control. And what has happened is we have this economy of information on the internet where basically anybody can have free publication. Mm -hmm. Nobody makes sure that it's of sufficient quality to be heard or to be published. Um, you can go on Amazon's Kindle marketplace. I've done this as an experiment, have a book, write AI, uh, have an AI write a book for you, publish that entirely on Amazon's marketplace and instantly start getting some money if the title's good enough. I've made about $15, it's amazing. And the book <laughs> cost me nothing to do. And I made sure that I, I explained in an article that this book is AI generated and it's just to make a point. And that's that I could have thrown 20, 30 books onto the Amazon marketplace. Each of them could have some sort of fantastic title that might sound life-changing. But the truth is, there's no quality control from me. There's no quality control from Amazon. <clears throat> it's an explosion of words and information and counterfeit knowledge without any gatekeepers. Well, the whole thing uh, begins with the fact that we get loads of uh, false information mm -hmm. and false news, and there is no control for that either. Yeah. So what happens is that information of all sorts, uh, news, literature, poetry, and what have you, history, are not being controlled. Yeah. And uh, truth has become something which is uh, very fragile. I don't know how to, to describe it, but, uh, and you know, our generation, at least my generation, at least we are familiar with the, most of the facts of things because we didn't study it via internet or via yeah. uh, Wikipedia or other sources like that. So we have the ability to uh, look into the information and, and think, is it correct, is it not? We mm -hmm. still remember some things that we have studied, but the young generation, they have, they have no other uh, real sources of information than, than the internet and AI and what have you. So yeah. they do not have, they do not have the tools and the power to make right from wrong. And mm -hmm. it, this is terrifying that they can be fed with false information altogether. I'm not talking about the quality mm -hmm. of the information, as you say. Yeah. Yeah. That, um, something for me, uh, I mean, maybe, maybe both of you could speak to this. Lately, as I've been scrolling through, you know, <laughs> social feeds and looking at images and videos, there's this thing in the back of my head and it's moving closer to the front of my head and it's saying, are you sure that's real? Can that really be real? Um, and more and more now, and I'm starting to pick up on the little cues that at least for the moment you can notice in AI generated imagery. Um, and I see maybe 50% of the, the fantastic looking things that I see are, I would guess AI generated and I wonder if you're starting to have that feeling as well, if when you go on the internet, you watch a video or you see um, a headline or something, is your first instinct, I don't know if this is real or is your first instinct to doubt it? It's growing more and more like this. 
I I didn't. Uh, some time ago, uh, what there was, what you saw was what there was. I mean, yeah. you got what you saw, and now what you see is what they tell you. You see, but you don't you don't know if what you see is what you really re you really see, as you say. Uh, and then you are so preoccupied with thinking, is it true or not, that you are not sure of anything. So this is one of, one of the dangers of AI. But let's talk about something else. And, and this is, uh, I was trying to try, I was trying to compare between the influence of the uh, industrial revolution on the world uh, and and see the uh, comparison between the impact of the uh, industrial revolution and the ai revolution mm -hmm. and i i think there are many similarities and i would like you to to elaborate on that if you want to okay yeah um that's something i've been researching and writing about too, both on um, a philosophical and a theological perspective. Technology is not in a vacuum, right? Our social ideas, our philosophical ideas, even our religious ideas feed into the technologies that we create, which feed back into those things. So yeah, the industrial revolution um, changed everything changed the world, changed the shape of the world, changed our air that we breathe. Um, the question becomes, and I don't think we can have a great answer for it, but we're starting to touch on some answers in our conversation already. How does the environment, and I mean the intellectual environment, I mean the way that we think about things, I mean the way that we speak, uh, the way that we function socially, how does that change in a world where everything has some form of AI integrated into it. Um, I wish I had an answer for that right now. I mean, if we talk about the most uh, trivial things, uh, the, the Industrial Revolution caused thousands and millions of, of people to lose their jobs because the machines were doing their job. Now we see already, for example, in the film industry, that mm -hmm. uh, AI is writing the scripts. Uh, AI is doing the, the, the is, is sometimes making the film. AI is giving the instructions. Uh, AI is selecting the uh, actors and actresses. Mm -hmm. And what have you? So all this, they are they are fearful, you know, in the in the film industry that AI is going to replace most of the jobs, maybe even the actors and actresses uh, that can be put on the screen without the help of of real people. Yeah, yeah. And it goes for all many other uh, areas of, of employment. So uh, it makes, me, uh, it makes wow. me wonder, on the one hand, um, how did the movie industry get so bad that the writers can be replaced by AI? <laughs> <laughs> yes. But yeah, um, I, I heard another thing that was interesting, and this really struck me, uh, based on the how quickly we see generative AI developing and how um, OpenAI's new video technology, for instance, is able to create incredible videos sometimes in one minute uh, or one minute videos. Um, I kind of imagine a future where this is what happens. Eventually another generation says, here's the type of thing that I want to listen to. And it'll generate music based on their preferences, according to their instructions. That's entirely new. And that's what they listen to. Not something from an artist, but something AI generated. They say, this is the type of movie I want to watch. And this is what the story should be about. And surprise me or something. And an entire movie is generated for them. I wonder, you know, if that's one of the type of ecological changes that we'll see from this generative AI. That's, uh, well, 
youngsters listening to to music that AI generated is the less uh, the less fearful thing uh, I'm I'm thinking about. There yeah. are more more worrying uh, phenomena that I uh, I fear. But I I want to th- to to say something. Mm-hmm. I I thought like when I read the Bible three thousand years back or maybe more, and I read the text, and I find out that uh, human human uh, uh, people that people have uh, uh, are, are described as having certain feelings like love like mm-hmm. envy like jealousy like uh, uh, the desire to to kill like uh, and all other feelings that exist uh, quite the same in our era in the area in the field of of feelings of emotions i think that the uh, the human race has retained and remained quite the same like thousands of years ago. And I, was, and I was thinking to myself, is AI going to change or control the way we feel, the way our emotions go? Uh, and, and this is a very interesting question because this has uh, has uh, I mean, a human uh, uh, nature has not changed in these fields. So many things have changed. <laughs> the world has completely changed in in how we how we do things, how we eat, how technology has overtaken us, AI, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the human nature has retained very similar to what it had been. Mm-hmm. And will this also change with AI? Well, I have a simple answer. Actually, I don't. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, I don't know that human feelings can change too significantly, but I think human appetites could. And I think that those could be affected. Um, I recently read a piece from a psychologist who said that AI generated porn is coming and it's going to be very bad for our brains. <laughs> Basically, because it will, it'll, it'll... If you're talking about porn, I was thinking to myself, what kind of feelings does a Japanese or a Taiwan guy uh, have towards a doll? that he falls in love with and has uh, sex with and and looks upon as his mate what what is the what how does it work what kind of feelings does he have towards or does she have towards this uh, this robot so to speak and how can one have feelings toward an inanimate object is, is uh, another... it's a fact you gotta know it that's uh that's always the question to me is like how does that work and i wonder if in generations where there is an increasing physical disconnect in communication and in um intimacy where more and more of it is done digitally if we will get to a place where there's more of an ability to feel something for something artificial or something that is a digital stand-in for what it was normally a physical reality. I don't know, Maybe. but if, the, if this if this robot uh, uh, woman gives him uh, an answer he doesn't like, uh, <laughs> he can he get mad. He can get mad at, at, at her. Yeah. Be, or, or angry, or if she tells him she's going out on a date with somebody else, uh, <laughs> you can become. I don't know. Uh, I mean, That's. It's beyond beyond my my ability to understand how you can develop a certain kind of feelings towards something that you know or you should understand mm-hmm. that is not is not real is 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 artificial. And it yet, is 
Yeah. And yet I'm sure that people develop feelings very similar to the feelings we have to, to humans. They develop the same kinds of feelings towards a, a robot. There's been, I mean, it, uh, beyond the robot side, there have been uh, dating chatbots. Yeah. And um, I've heard all kinds of stories about that. I'm with you in that it's not something that I fully understand. And I wonder if it's because I'm, you know, of a different generation. Well, don't say that because I will feel awkward. <laughs> 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 we've, we've spoken about that. Another thing, you know, I asked, I was, I was uh, cheeky enough to ask AI, what are the dangers of AI? <laughs> yeah. uh, yes. I wanted AI to tell me what the dangers of AI and how can we overcome them? Okay. And the main and the main thing AI said to me, my friend, he said, we can overcome many or most of the dangers of AI, which he listed very fairly, mm -hmm. uh, by the fact that AI is first of all transparent, and second of all, because of its accessibility. Uh, the accessibility is to everyone and and uh, nobody is excluded from using it it is for all human beings to use mm -hmm. and it is transparent so people can check it and and as 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 uh, but but you doubt that and i want to to hear what you have to say about this answer that these threats which i haven't spoken about but i can yeah. elaborate on that uh, can be uh lowered by the fact that uh, ai is has uh, accessibility to anyone and is transparent to everyone yeah yeah um i've been doing a lot of uh research and experimentation with um, generative AI models that are truly accessible to everyone. And by that, I mean their weights, the weights that determine how they choose things, how they choose what to say, how they operate are open source and they're available to anyone who has the knowledge to look at the code and to even do their own fine tuning and modify the AI for their purposes. Now that's open and transparent, right? Now Google or OpenAI or Anthropic, those are all, or even Mistral's new models. Um, those are all commercial and they're closed source. Nobody gets to see what's going on behind, how they're training it, any of that. So there's already this transparency disconnect, right? Um, the other thing is the accessibility to everyone in a very early stage, in a very simple sense. Yes, that can be fair because it's a level playing field, but once AI gets to a certain point and once it gets to even anywhere near a human level of intelligence, which we're very close to, um, there becomes a risk of how does its motivations, which we assume will develop with a certain level of intelligence, how will its motivations align with our motivations? And if there is a failure in alignment, then what are the risks to us? Many people, and I just read uh, Nick Bostrom's book on this topic. It was published in 2014, but philosophically it remains uh, relevant for today. Many people believe that there is a legitimate existential risk for humans um, when AI reaches that level of intelligence, not, not because it would be programmed to destroy humanity or to destroy the environment or anything, but because the, the intermediary goals on its way to its big goal, whatever that is, making paper clips, um, 
would be detrimental to humans. For instance, a paperclip making AI that reaches the level of super intelligence and has its own will and consciousness might decide that, well, I can make paper clips better if the whole world is leveled and I strip mine all of the earth and then start to go into the rest of the universe and turn everything into paper clips, right? Mm -hmm. um, we don't know, we have enough trouble with our own motivations, understanding our own motivations, and we know what our level of intelligence is. Uh, when we get to a mind that is completely different than our own, it might be trained on our data, but it operates in a way that ours doesn't operate. It's constructed out of things that ours aren't constructed out of. It hasn't evolved like we have. Um, how do we understand or even project the motivations of that type of mind, especially when it is orders of magnitude more intelligent than us, when its intelligence compared to ours is, is comparable to our intelligence compared to a beetle? or something. Um, I think that's where the real risks come in is um, when we're dealing with something that's superior to us, what becomes of us? And there's and all sorts of answers, but. Uh, another thing that I uh, was thinking about is that all the information that is being gathered about every human individual on this earth is, is stored somewhere. Yeah. And the fear is that all, all the resources of AI will be concentrated in the hands of few. Yeah. Yeah. Of a very small, uh, amount of people who are multi, multi billionaires who mm -hmm. will control and have uh, all this information in their hands. So it might remain in the hands of individuals, but a very small, like we know nowadays that uh, it happens already. Mm -hmm. But what happens if all this information is taken over by governments? Yeah who will use this information in order to change the order of the world and return to sort of feudalism that uh, they it's it's like a dictatorship yeah. with, with the with the, with the uh, information they have with the control they have they have over uh, the knowledge all the knowledge that 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 we as individuals have no privacy whatsoever and these uh, regimes who will will overtake the information we can go go back maybe to the to dark ages i think that's a very real risk i mean look at the the ai in terms of who controls the most powerful ai models in the world right now it's just what you described. It's located in a little pocket of San Francisco. Yes. And they get to decide what the values of that AI, what those values are. Um, they get to talk to the governments and say, hey, there's a real risk. So you better make it hard for people to enter this arena and create AI models like we have. By the way, here's our model. And, um, you know, you're going to be okay because we're talking together, right? They're, yeah. they're in, in bed with the governments. And the reason why they're promoting, um, the reason why they're promoting regulation so hard, which almost seems, wait a second, why are they doing that? It makes perfect sense because they're keeping these models out of the hands of others. They're making sure that it's not democratic, that it, that it is um, futile in that way that there's, you know. But, but my fear is that the people who will own these, uh, these powers will be the same people who make the regulations. Yeah, I think that's what's happening. And, and that's the problem. They will make regulations that will enable them to use all these powers for themselves 
and enable them to control us. Yeah, and it's strange because that's never happened before in history, right? <laughs> what is happening in the, in the terms of of ethics? We know that in medicine there's bioethics and and many things that many ethical uh, uh, decisions and regulations which have uh, somehow kept the inventions in the medical field uh, under a certain control, yeah, uh, like cleansing and things like that. Mm -hmm. What happens in the way of ethical codes for the usage of AI? It's a very, very important question that governments are scrambling to answer because they're already behind, right? These models are getting more and more powerful. They didn't have any uh, uh, By the minute, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, by the minute, really. And we're, we're, we're chasing, I mean, in a sense, many people believe it's already too late. They've already advanced so much. They're not going to go back and change the code for no. these things. So they're, they're trying to make these ethical frameworks after the fact. And, you know, I mean, it's good in the one sense that the governments are taking it so seriously. They didn't take things so seriously when social media began to take over the Internet. Now they are. But at the speed at which AI advancements moving, it could be too late. Um, there's a lot of a lot being written right now on AI ethics, on discovering the biases of different models. In fact, I just published a peer-reviewed uh, journal article in, um, you'll like the name of this journal, HIFIL, Novum. It's a um, journal that uh, deals with uh, computational biblical Hebrew, actually. Mm. And um, my small contribution was using generative narrative extension and generative um, like law writing based on biblical texts to figure out, okay, based on what the AI generates, what are its biases? What are its underlying beliefs, right? Um, so I had it generate five new commandments for the 10 commandments. I had it generate um, a fifth chapter of Jonah. Mm -hmm. And analyzing all these different AI models, I was able to show some pretty clear biases that were programmed into the model. And these are biases that reflected the Western, primarily Western, mostly American type political ideals of the place where the models came from. So ethics, yeah, it's, it's an important consideration now. And, and unfortunately, we're a step behind. And I want to come back uh, to close our conversation this evening to something we spoke about, and maybe we can look into, uh, at it in, in a, a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, the story of the Tower of Babylon. Yes. And uh, maybe, maybe now, after this conversation, we can understand that maybe in those days, the story, the situation, and the era mm -hmm. where the people of Babylon were, were in was a similar thing to what is happening now. Everyone is talking in the same language, the mm -hmm. language of AI. And we, the world is building this huge, enormous tower of AI. And God says, mm -hmm. well, we have to spread the people it's getting yeah. too dangerous this mm -hmm. one language which is taking over and controlling the world so that's another way of looking at the story yeah. and maybe this enables us to understand what is behind the decision because we said to ourselves uh, last time what have the people of babylon done wrong to get yeah. this punishment and be discovered. Yeah, exactly. And maybe it's a symbol of the situation that we are facing now with the one language of the world 
that mm -hmm. is building this enormous tower and maybe it's leading us to destruction that has to be prevented by mm -hmm. changing the rules. You know, earlier um, you had said that the emotions of humanity have not changed over all of these eons. Yes, I did say it's, that. It's remarkable to me that such an old story can be so relevant now. And it's because essentially we are still the same. The, you know, it came, the idea came to me instantly, just now as we're talking. Uh, yeah. I didn't think about it before, but suddenly I saw the similarity, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, the ability of the people to communicate is what enabled them to build that tower, right? Right. And the so tower the story, was to reach, to reach into heaven. Right. And now what are we saying? We are going to create a new world economy. We are going to... You know, this is going to free up everybody's time and we're going to have universal basic income. And, and, and talking the same, uh, the same computer language, you know. And, yeah. Uh, actually, we are talking, we are all talking in the same language. It's not English or French. It's the language of AI, let's say, uh, for, for yeah. the resemblance. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and then what we accomplish as a result of that, this tower gets taller every day and the pace of growth seems to be growing what happens does god confound our tongues and scatter us throughout the earth again who knows this is a good question to, to leave uh for the next conversation and it was lovely having us all being together and i think we left some uh, big question marks unanswered but that's the purpose i mean we have to uh, leave some things for the future. Well, and time, we, times will tell. Times will tell. Yeah, if we think hard enough, I think we can come up with answers to all of them by next week. <laughs> <laughs>